Live from Western Kentucky University, capital of the Hilltopper Nation. Whether it's in the locker room or on the field, behind the clipboard or on the court, home or away, we've got you covered. Get ready to enter the Red Zone, your destination for all things sports, right here on Revolution 91.7. Welcome back in to Mass Media and Technology Hall on the campus of Western Kentucky University. Josh Holland here hosting Red Zone once again with Billy Rutledge and Fletcher Keel. And folks, if you missed us out there, we apologize. We could not handle the snow here at Mass Media. And there was a lot. Billy almost got arrested for yeah, trying to get in here. It was pretty bad. So I didn't even try the second time. Well, I, was, I didn't want to go to jail. Well, you know, I have. I a, appreciate our listeners, but I didn't think that we should go to jail. We had a commitment to the listeners to do the show, so I went up to Mass trying to get in, and they had the doors locked, and the police yelling at me when I was trying to get in, and so I had to make a run for the border, Fletcher. My goodness, you ran for a long time. Oh, I went to Birmingham. Which border? Oh, oh, okay. Which that border? <laughs> the border Alabama for Alabama, border, Alabama border, I suppose. I Which guess. kind? In, it, Kind of is a different country, I guess. In defense of the police officers, Billy, you do look super shady with your new longer hair. It's, well, they probably saw the flow and they got jealous, so they started had to scream at me. I don't think that I don't I don't know the rule or the law, the law <laughs> where think, police officers arrest people because they're jealous. Well, you know they can be jealous all the time. And, uh, drug know, deals treat obviously me differently than somebody that they don't feel jealous about. But you know, well, you know who happens. is jealous, fellas, the WK men's basketball team. They're jelly right now. Are the Lady Tops. <laughs> because they, they're they out of the tournament. The Lady Tops are in the tournament. We're going to start with the men because we've got a whole lot of Lady Tops coming at you. We're going to have Rick Cantu from the Austin American Statesman giving us some knowledge on the Texas Longhorns. And then we'll talk all about Coach Hurd and how she's impacted this program. But first, the men wrapped up their season in the Conference USA tournament in a, in a similar fashion to how they wrapped up the season last year. A one-point loss on the final possession of the game. And, fellas, you were both there for the entire game. I was covering the Lady Toppers game and got there for about the last three minutes, so I'm, I'm sure it's my fault they lost because they were leading when I got there. But a four-point lead with a minute and a half left to go in the game, and it slips away, and so does the end of the WKU season and the end of the season for three seniors. Yeah, it was very unfortunate, and there were uh, you know a few close calls at the very end of the game, and it looked like Chris Her- or Nigel Snipes was going to have a chance to win it at the buzzer, but he passed up the shot for Chris, and uh, it just wasn't meant to be, really. And there was a... Yeah, in my opinion, a horrendous five-second call. Yeah, but right before, before you talk about Nigel Snipes, I thought the entire time for about a week that you know until today that Nigel Snipes passed up this wide-open shot. It really wasn't that wide open. I was going back and cutting tape for tomorrow's extra point. It was and the most was, open. It, I, Harrison Dox was a little bit more open, and he's a better shoot, three-point shooter. So if there's any discrepancy between who's more open there, it's got to go to Harrison Dox there because percentage-wise and with the way they talk about him in practice, he's the best three-point shooter on the team, even better than T.J. Price percentage-wise. And so even though T.J. had a career year, but if those shots are even close, then I'm with Nigel. I'm passing that up to Chris. Well, percentage-wise, he still hit the backboard. You know what I mean? Like it was that bad of a shot. Like I don't. If he was so open, he would have had a clean shot at it. Yeah, but, but the shot wasn't any less open than Nigel Snipes. Just because it was a bad shot does not mean it wasn't a good shot. Does it? Just that, because it makes the shot, sense. It makes sense. But at the time, it, it, the play, the way the play developed, it, Nigel should have just taken the shot. Well, and, but he made an extra pass, and that's what Harper's been, you know, hold, saying the entire year is making extra pass. It just. In my opinion, I thought Nigel should have taken the shot. Well, going back to your point about letting the play develop, when it started, it started on the inbounds pass, and then Trincy Jackson held it at the far wing from where we were for about four seconds. And those are precious seconds that are ticking off the clock, so instead of trying to look for the pass first, he tried to size up the guy that he was defending, and that's when he made his cut to the lane. And he wasn't sizing up the guy. He was waiting for George to come for the screen. That's the reason he held the ball, because the play was George comes for the screen. When George slips, if the guy's... If the guy doesn't go with George, it's a bounce pass. George cuts to the basket. If the guy goes with George, Trinchy drives. But UAB, to their credit, played that really, really well. They switched defensively. So it wasn't so much Trinchy Jackson holding out and not making a move. It was him waiting for the play to start. And and it, it's it's one of those plays that you had, what was it, 14 seconds or so to, to work with? Right, right, and right. the whole time I'm sitting there thinking the Hilltoppers aren't going to wait for the final shot of the game. 
and then they wind up waiting for the final shot of the of the game. I thought they certainly or they would have tried to get a quick shot off and and have George or I th- believe Ben Lawson was on the floor at the time try to get that rebound, then either kick it back out or with the power that those two have, just put it up uh, at the buzzer. And then if you lose on a close shot like they did last year to Lafayette down in New Orleans, you'll lose that way as well. And, but obviously they went for the three pointer to Harrison Dox that uh, he got the pass from. Nigel Snipes when it wasn't an open shot and and when I watched it live I, I we didn't get to see the replay because the BJCC where the Legacy Arena was didn't show a replay on the vi- on the big board or whatever I was just thinking why Trinity didn't drive there and then looking back on it there are a couple guys coming into the lane that would have made it basically impossible to get there but so just just different stages of of thinking about it after the game but and then some of it as well. You, you don't want this game to end because you don't want to see the careers of T.J. Price, George Fant, and Trincy Jackson end either. Yeah, I think it's really important, though. There's a lot of shots that I go back and look at and think, man, why did they do that, or why did they take this shot, or, or, or anything of the like. UAB played really good defense on that final possession. They switched man. They, they stayed at home when Nigel Snipes had open so the guy could switch over to Chris Harrison jo- Docks. They played really good defense, and... Whether or not that five-second call against Harrison Dock set up the win, that last, you know, 45 seconds, UAB played better than WKU did. They yeah. had an open guy from the elbow. They played better defense on the final possession. They definitely got outplayed in the final four minutes. It was really Western had a lead, and they were in control of the game. And then UAB, being in Birmingham, it was definitely a home crowd. You could feel that it was in the energy. probably the best crowd of the entire week, even better than when MT- than when UAB. Uh, played in the championship game against MTSU, and I believe the announced crowd for that was somewhere around 8,400. I, I don't remember if a crowd was ever announced for the WKU game, but it felt more uh, like a better crowd, like a louder crowd for that for that WKU UAB game than any other game that I was at all weekend. And that's just the perks of hosting the tournament. It's just yeah. your home fans get to play. And it was actually a pretty cool story them winning with the football uh, program shutting down the this year before, but. You know, Western, I liked the play call. I liked going to George, even though it ended up didn't happening. They had to give it to him at the time. He had, uh, like, a game-high 18 points. He had really just dominated the entire game. So, initial thought. Which, game-high 18 points in a game that was decided in the 50s is a lot different than a game-high 18 in the 70s. Like, that 18 points was really important in that game. Right, and it was a lot better than his performance against Marshall, where he was in early foul trouble and was a non-factor at all. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was the last game of George Fant's career, and he, he came out playing like the old George fan and just they couldn't get the ball and, and the on defense. the flip side TJ Price kind of went away kind of with the wind quietly I only had six points I believe in that game and, and still was able to facilitate like he usually does but didn't put up the the numbers we were accustomed to seeing ending a game of, or a streak of 14 games in a row scoring in double figures and so it's kind of interesting to see Fant have the off night the night before and then uh, kind of play his game in the UAB game when it was kind of the reverse for TJ it's kind of an end of an era too really i know it's the end of price fant and jackson jackson's been here for a short time but price and fan have really embodied what it means to be a wku basketball player mm-hmm. here and they've played all four years and it seems like you know you can't i can't think of a time wku basketball where w- those two weren't involved I, i'm only a sophomore here on the hill but you know it's just they're losing well, so much part of part of what what makes them losing so much part of it's the stats i mean where they're going to finish in history one of you know one or two of the guys i, I would say if one of them gets their jersey in the raptors both of them probably do yep but, but i have think, 244 saying in there yeah, too. <laughs> I, I think just george and jim right beside each other but i think what is biggest for me and a lot of wku fans is what has happened in the past three years you know or three and a half years you, you lose a coach you get another head coach you win two conference championships in the you know four games in four days you transition to a new conference with with Ray Harper, and it's kind of similar for. We'll talk about the Lady Toppers later, but when when George Fant and T.J. Price graduate, it's kind of like when Alexis Govan and Chastity Gooch graduate because they were with the transition to a new coach and they were with the transition to a new conference. There's probably not going to be another two set of players as good as T.J. Price and George Fant together at the same time that carries a team through those transitions because I don't see another time when you're you're getting a new head coach the year before you go to a new conference. It's just it's likelihood not going to happen. And so when I look back on TJ Price and George Fant, it's less about what they did statistically and more about how they facilitated a team through two big transitions. And I mean a lot of it too is especially with George or only with George is he's the hometown kid. 
even when he was struggling uh, throughout this season or, or throughout the past couple of years, he's he's the name that brings the l- largest amount of cheers. Went to Warren Central. From, yeah, exactly, from Diddle Arena. So you hear from Bowling Green, Kentucky, from Tony Rose, the place gets loud immediately. And, and that's really cool for a school like WKU to have. Uh, to have that hometown kid and fan who got a lot of college offers from a lot of higher up Big 12 D1 schools and such. And so to see him pick WKU with, with his family coming here and him playing literally right across the street, it'll be hard to, to see that come to an end as well. I talked to Todd Stewart after the men's loss the day after, and we were talking about where Price and Fant will go down in WKU history, at least statistically wise. Prance, Price, I just combined the two names right there. Price. Prince. Price is sixth in scoring all time, and Fan eighth in scoring and thirteenth all time in re- all time rebounding list. And Todd was saying a little bit what you like you said, Josh, is they meant so much to this team, and they've kept them at a higher level of play where it could have dipped, where Harper could have came in and they could have not, you know, won went eleven and eight and won the Sun Belt Conference there, and they couldn't have won it again. And so them to be able to do it at the same time has really, you know been able to elevate this program into a better conference and now into, you know, the conversation of, you know, they should be attempting to make the NCAA tournament every year. And what will be interesting for me is when they're off this team, I think it becomes – there's if you look at programs around the country, Duke is Mike Krzyzewski. Michigan State is Tom Izzo. You know, UNC is Roy Williams. No matter how good of the players they have – and don't get me wrong – I'm not saying Ray Harper has had that impact on this program just yet, but after the players that come before him and George Fant and T.J. Price leave, then I want, I'm want i curious to see what the view of the Hilltopper basketball program is. Is it Ray Harper? Is that the face of the program now? Because for the past four years, the face of the program has been T.J. Price and George Fant. And so with them gone, it seems less of George and T.J.'s team led by Coach Harper and more of Coach Harper's team if he continues success. Well, there's going to definitely be a, a initial setback, you know, losing the two best players, two of some of the best players. Two of the top right. seven scorers in conference. Right, exactly. So, you know, losing them is going to be a real gut check for Harper. It's, he got his third straight 21 season. It's something that John Oldham, EA Diddle never did in their time here. So, you know, he's already on historic pace in his first three seasons and already got two conference ch- championships. So I think it's going to be, you know, very defining of Harper and how they do this next season. I mean, think of what next year's starting lineup could look like. Chris Harrison docks, Justin Johnson, Alex Rostov, or Ben Lawson. If you want to start both, great, but most likely one of them will start and one of them will be a bench guy like we saw this year. Maybe DJ Clayton and maybe Nigel Snipes. Of the five guys that could potentially see the floor to or to begin the game every night, Chris Harrison docks is really the only name that's still left. And, and I would say that he could be that one to follow in the footsteps of George, TJ, and Trincy, but he's only going to be here for, what, another year? And then he's going to have to leave as well. And so I don't think he'll be here long enough by himself to be able to do what George and TJ did in order to make it his own team with Coach Harper and everyone else. Well, Western's got some good freshmen coming in too, and also a JUCO player, Justin Edmonds, should come in and complete for their Frederick. starting job. Frederick Edmonds, excuse me. He should come in and start for the starting job near right away so you know he's going to get some production coming in even though price and fan are leaving it's just that this team's going to have to gel a little bit differently it's not mm-hmm. going to be tj price that is going to try to get that last winning shot it's going to let's see who's going to have to step up is it going to be chris that's going to shoot a three or is justin johnson going to finally mature and he's a little raw right now is he going to mm-hmm. you know balance his game a little bit out Make an interesting point fletcher because not only we talked about uh, we talked about carrying through conference championships through coaching change but it's it's hard to leave that legacy when you're only the lead dog for a year and a half or two years. Mm-hmm. You mentioned that with Chris Harrison Docks. There probably isn't another time in the foreseeable future because of the way the roster, you know, the roster will bring in two freshmen. So when Harrison Docks leaves, they're juniors, and then they take over. And, and that's that's going to be the cycle, and that's that's a healthy cycle for a college yes. basketball program. Yeah. But it does not lend to someone being the face of a program for four years like it did when Price – and Fant came in with Derek Gordon in that initial class. And and that's fine, I think. I, I I shouldn't be saying this on on radio, but I didn't know much of anything about WKU sports before coming here, and so that first team with Derek Gordon, uh, Vinny Zolo. should have put a long bleed. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Derek Gordon, Vinny Zolo, TJ, and George. That was the my first in, in, impression of WKU basketball, and that's all I've known is that team. And and kind of the way – I don't know if it was just a rebuilding year or just a whole bunch of turnover or whatever, but it, it, was, it was weird. 
weird that that they did go through that, and we've been talking off air all the time, Josh, and some with Billy, and we've been saying that I don't think in the next decade or so we'll ever see a WKU team with four freshmen in the starting lineup, and, and you're absolutely right. That's healthy for, for a cycle in terms of graduation and players coming in for the Hilltoppers. So we're losing a couple Hilltoppers on the Hill, but there are still a few seniors, three of them for another team, the Lady Toppers, that will be in action on Friday Big game for the Lady Toppers. When we come back, we're going to bring on Rick Cantu from the Austin American Statesman so he can educate us on all things Lady Longhorns. Thanks for tuning in to this week's edition of the WKU Red Zone here on Revolution 91.7. It's me, your heart. High blood pressure is serious. And if you think I'm just going to keep ticking away, you're wrong. I can quit whenever I want, but I like my job. Just treat me better. Maybe we can do some exercise on occasion. After all, we're in this together. Don't let your heart quit on you. High blood pressure can lead to a stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range before it's too late. Find out how at heart.org slash blood pressure. A message from the American Heart Association, the American Stroke Association, and the Ad Council. Remember when your neighbor found us naked in the car And the time some outdoor action got us kicked out of the park Getting frisky in the dark, I gave your eye a poke I think the dog is also in the bed Do I smell smoke, you and me? We never, ever, ever give up You didn't give up on sex Don't give up on birth control either. There are more methods than you think. Visit Bedsider.org to compare all the choices. Brought to you by Bedsider and the Ad Council. Bedsider.org. Keeping you up to date on Western Kentucky sports, you're in the red zone right here on Revolution 91.7. I get no doubt. Welcome back into the WKU Red Zone. The snow knocked us down for a couple weeks, but in we the words back of Chumbawamba, we thank survived. you, Fletcher. No. I think that's I think that was uh, Destiny's Child that you're referencing. Yes. No, I did with, not reference I think we're saying with Chumbawamba with the song, getting dude, back on. up again. About a quarter after the hour here on WKU Red Zone, we talked a little bit of the gentleman hoops, but the rest of the show is devoted to a lady topper team that is making the NCAA tournament for the second consecutive year, something the men did. Two years ago, back in the end of the Sun Belt Conference, their first matchup will be against the Longhorns of Texas, a five seed versus a 12 seed that happens in Berkeley, California, Friday at 4 p.m. To educate us a little bit on the Longhorns team that we certainly haven't seen this year, this time we'd like to welcome on Rick Cantu from the Austin American Statesman. Rick, how are you? Hey, I'm good. Good to be with you guys. Yeah, thanks for coming on, Rick. And, and last minute notice, giving you a heads up this morning, but I appreciate your flexibility. So, Rick. When we first figured out from Michelle Clark Hurd and from, I guess, the ESPN broadcast of, of who WKU would play as a as a 12 seed and it would be Texas, she said, well, they were a long team. They got one really tall girl. But it seems like you can say that about most teams. But after looking at the roster, that that's, that's oh so true. So what is the strength of this Texas basketball team? Well, first of all, they got two really tall girls. Um, they've got six foot seven Imani McGee Stafford, and they got six foot five Kelsey Lang, and uh, both are interchangeable. They're both great shot blockers. So Texas has a height advantage against every team they play from the uh, from the front court. Uh, they have struggled against the good shooting teams in the past, and usually those two uh young women that I I mentioned don't play at the same time they rarely do the twin tower thing but uh they're a tall team they're a good rebounding team they're an average shooting team uh they're a team that's probably playing better right now than they did midway through the season uh which is a good thing for them Rick Fletcher Keel here what was the reaction on the Texas side of things when the Longhorns found out that it would be Western Kentucky facing them in Berkeley on Friday well, to be honest with you, they don't know much about Western Kentucky. And, you know, it's not like the men's game where you get a lot of men's games on television every night throughout the uh, basketball season. You know, I, I, I barely know UConn's roster and they're, they're the ones that are on TV every, every so often and, and maybe, maybe Tennessee. So most of them didn't know Western Kentucky. They don't know Conference USA. They don't know Chastity Gooch, for example. But um, they didn't on Monday, but I can guarantee you they know her today. 
Rick, we, I was looking at the roster and the schedule of this Texas team once it's, it was announced, and I noticed that they started the year on a little bit of a slow start, 4-8, and eight, and now they've won seven of, seven of their last nine going into the tournament. So what do you think, in your personal opinion, has been the main difference of these two Texas teams in two different stretches of the season? Well, uh, you didn't mention the start of the season where they went 13-0, and and they beat Stanford, they beat Tennessee, they beat Texas A&M. Then they lost their best player, Neca and Impali, a senior forward for the season with an ACL injury. And it was about that time that they went on that four and eight skid that seemed like it was just going to just destroy the season. But in the last nine games, they finally got accustomed to playing without Neca. Uh, it took that long. She was their leading scorer and their leading rebounder and um, the, basically the heart of the team, and it took that long to regroup, so to speak, and, and now they're playing not as well as they did in the first 13 games, but they're a lot better than that middle portion where they were struggling. Speaking with Rick Cantu from the Austin American Statesman in Austin, Texas, and Rick, you mentioned that they've struggled against some teams that have shot the ball well. What other weaknesses, if you're if you're looking from the Western Kentucky side, what other weaknesses would the opposing team try to attack in this Longhorn basketball team? I think the biggest weakness of the Texas team is they don't shoot that well from the perimeter. They were either ninth or 10th in the Big 12, and the Big 12 only has 10 teams, of course, in, in three-point shooting. They're not a very good three-point shooting, and when you can guard the bigs, then that forces them to shoot that outside shot. Their point guard is a true freshman, and she just looked um, a little out of sorts in the Big 12 tournament. She didn't shoot well. She didn't play well. Her eyes were, you know, like saucers. So uh, they're they're not necessarily weak at the point guard position, but they're very inexperienced there. So uh, And, of course, you know, in big-time college basketball, the point guard is sometimes the most important player. Rick? Seven of their last nine have the Lady Longhorns won, but in those two games, what was it that had them not go on a nine-game winning streak to end the season? Was it that poor perimeter shooting, or was there something else going on on the floor there? Well, there were two games. Um, they blew a 16-point lead to West Virginia on the road with about six minutes to go. They blew the entire lead. I just think they got real passive. I think they got too um comfortable with the lead and just let it slip away that's one game that they definitely should have won the other was against baylor in the championship game in the big 12 tournament and baylor is just superior to almost every team they've played this year in fact baylor is probably the best team they've played this year um i think that baylor was worthy of a one seed the big 12 is the number one rpi conference in the country uh, they did get a two seed, um, which is not necessarily bad, but a 32 and three record is pretty good. They just got outplayed in in the Baylor game. There's been uh, a lot, at least in, in the media notes from this side, about the history of this matchup. There's you know the second most matchups from Longhorn history postseason wise is three with WKU. WKU coach Michelle Clark Hurd played Texas you know four seasons in a row back when she was a player here. But how much is that history talked about from Texas side, especially when they haven't played since the 90s? Well, I went to the selection show with the University of Texas basketball team, and their former coach, Jody Conrad, who was in the Basketball Hall of Fame, was there. And as soon as Western Kentucky was the name that came up on the screen, I mean, she just lit up. I mean, she has got the history because of what happened in 1985 and what happened in 1986. And uh, for your listeners that may not know, Texas was on the verge, or they thought they were on the verge of winning the national championship and playing the Final Four at home in 1985. And Western Kentucky beat them in the in the uh, semifinals of the regionals uh, in Bowling Green on a last second shot, and that just tore the heart out of the Texas ball team because that was going to be their first ever national championship, and they were going to win it at home. Then in 86, they regrouped and became the first team ever in women's basketball ever to finish the season with a national championship with, and an unbeaten record. So the agony of 85 turned into the ecstasy of 86. 
Rick, a bit, a bit of a fun question here. You have a couple, you've had a couple days to think about it, a couple more days to think about it. How are you going to describe to the Longhorn fans who follow you and read your stuff uh, when they ask you what exactly Big Red is? Well, I, I, they're going to assume you're talking about the Corn Huskers. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, you know, Nebraska was in the Big Twelve for the first twelve or thirteen years, and they just recently moved to the Big Ten. Uh, I, I know that Big Red is is big basketball country because I've seen Western Kentucky show up on selection shows in the men's and the women's for years. And uh, they may not know where Western Kentucky is, uh, the university is, but um, I did. T- let me tell you this: I talked to Fran Harris today. Fran was on the 1985 team and the 86 team that played Western Kentucky, and she said that they played the 85 game in Bowling Green, and she said it was one of the greatest um, road crowds that she'd ever played in. She says they had an extremely great fan base. She remembers that um, the support for, I guess the, they call them the Lady Toppers, is, um, is, is one of the unmatched um, fan bases that she can recall. And she, um, she applauded uh, Western Kentucky for its fan base, and she said she remembers a sea of red up there in the, uh, up in the bleachers. Marie, before we let you go, it seems like about as neutral court of a game as, as you can have with both teams playing pretty far away from home in California. But what is your gut feeling? You know, a lot of depth down low for, for the Longhorns, but some inexperience up top going into this tournament. What is your gut feeling about how they perform as a five-seed against a 12-seed Western Kentucky? Uh, I think you can throw the five and the 12 out because I think Western Kentucky is better than a 12. Uh, Conference USA is better than most people think. Of course, I'm a little partial because... I graduated from a school in the Conference USA, and that's the University of Texas, El Paso, which has a decent women's basketball team, a lot better last year. I think I think Texas wins the ball game if they can feed the ball down low and the 6'7 and 6'5 girls can, can take advantage of the um, of take advantage of the uh, lack of height, so to speak, for Western Kentucky. I saw their tallest starter is only six foot. But I think Western Kentucky wins the game if they can get hot. Uh, Chastity Gooch, I mentioned her before, I think she's going to be very hard to uh, counter. I don't know if uh, Texas has played someone as multidimensionally talented as she did this year. I think it's a toss-up game. If I had to go with my gut, I would say the Longhorns probably because they've played more good teams. They played eight teams in the NCAA tournament, um, a total of um, 16 times they played. That includes a lot of Big 12 teams that were in the top 25. But um, that, that's my take. I don't know. I'm usually wrong anyway, but it's going to be a good one. I'm looking forward to going to Berkeley for the first time. Yeah, well, how are you going to spend your, your off time there in Berkeley, Rick? I'm gonna. I'm just gonna walk around campus, go to the bookstore, mingle with you know. Just take my camera, look at the sights. Maybe go to San Francisco later. I'm I'm lucky. I used to go with the Cowboys when they played the 49ers back in the day when both teams were good. So I love that Bay Area and uh, Northern California, Napa. It's one of my favorite uh, places in the country. All right, Rick. Well, enjoy your time in. California, thanks for taking some time to join us here. That was Rick Cantu, sports writer. And if you look at his Twitter, also rocket scientist for the Austin American Statesman, you can follow him at Ricky Prep for updates from Longhorn Basketball. Rick, thanks for your time. Hey, I enjoy talking to you guys. So we're going to take a break here after talking to Mr. Rick Cantu from the Austin American Statesman. Stay tuned. We'll talk about what he said and the history of this lady type of program coming up here on the Red Zone on Revolution 91.7. Me, a cat, moving in with a single guy. At first, I thought it might be a little weird, but turns out it's actually pretty amusing. For instance, like my human's gotten so used to me being around, sometimes I think he forgets I'm here. He'll get up for work, shower, shave, and come out with no pants. Plops right down in front of the TV. Hello, there's a lady in the room. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the (laughs) ShelterPetProject.org. 
Who might you save? Your mother, your father, your husband, uncle, aunt, son. Learn fast. F-A-S-T. The sudden signs of a stroke. F. Face drooping. A. Arm weakness. S. Speech difficulty. T. Time to call 911. You could save. Your friend, teacher, boss. So learn F-A-S-T. Then pass it on. Because you never know who might save you. Your wife, your colleague. Spot a stroke fast. Visit strokeassociation.org. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association and the Ad Council. Talking all things Tapper Sports, you're listening to Red Zone on Revolution 91.7. Welcome back into the Red Zone on Revolution 91.7. Josh Holland here with Billy Rutledge and no one else in studio. Oh, hey, it's Fletcher Keel. Oh, hey, how's it going? Fletcher got a trophy before the show went on because... I heard his feelings. Yeah. And he's been so happy ever since. It's just I'm the It's amusing how this is this, this makes him happy. It it's a Jeff Brotherhood, we are the champions trophy, but on the other side the fine folks here at Revolution FM have uh declared someone to be the artist of the week and so they taped this piece of paper saying artist of the week on it. Well, the the side of the paper where it says A has ripped off, so it currently says Tist of the week. So I guess I'm the unofficial first ever tist of the week here at Revolution and I couldn't be more excited about it. I don't think your mom could be more proud. Oh, congratulations. To get to face those Texas Longhorns that we just talked about, the Lady Toppers had I guess the word interesting fits for the journey through the Conference USA tournament. Now they end on greater than a 10 game win streak, one of seven teams going into the NCAA tournament, but the last three weren't so easy. They all came down to one possession, two of them came down to Alexis Govan shooting two free throws from the line. It all started in Charlotte, where WKU had a 16-point lead. Well, there was a trend of WKU having a 15 or more point lead, and then it becoming a one-possession game to Old Dominion and then to Southern Miss. Right, it ended very close. Charlotte was 70-67, Old Dominion 61-59, and Southern Miss 60-57 in championship. So a combined eight points that they won by and it was and it was western in every game it seemed like they built a lead a double digit lead and they lost it there was a they would stretch. go on incredible runs they would they, and they went on a 24 to 2 run against old dominion to start they, the game one day yes and then a 20 to 2 run against other miss and it was still a one possession game yep it sure was and i and we didn't get to for obvious reasons we were out there filming and taking pictures of the lady topper celebrating but we didn't get to go into the southern miss press conference but we were there for the old dominion press conference with their head coach uh first name's karen escaping barefoot. me yeah karen barefoot and uh jenny sims who was named to the all conference or the all tournament team for conference usa and and sims was was a bit quiet as you'd expect a player to be just getting knocked out of a tournament but Coach Barefoot was fired up, and there were a couple a couple times where she got she got real intense in the way of of a teacher who kind of is like you got or, or like a parent saying you don't respect what I do for you something, and it was kind of like that that uncomfortable moment. And in so many words, Coach Barefoot was essentially saying we as Old Dominion should have beaten Western Kentucky in this game, and, and in some aspects she's right. WKU had stretches didn't play like. A championship caliber team, but that's what makes championship caliber teams championship caliber is that they're able to overcome their mistakes, especially when the game is on the line, and especially when you have a player like Alexis Govan who can hit key free throws. WKU would play like a top 10 team that was placed in the wrong conference for about four minutes. <laughs> and then, I don't know what happened. It, you know, there were there were four minute stretches, and granted, their motto, their the whole way they do things is playing in four minute stretches. If you talk to Coach Hurd, you, they go out for four minutes, they come back. Coach Hurd says, "Well, you either lost that or you won that four minutes, or it was tied." Then you got to play another four minutes. So maybe they just only wanted to play one, one four minutes. I don't know, but they would come out and play like they a just top, wanted to make it interesting for us. <laughs> yeah, they they were, the tournament covering them. They, they would play like a top fifteen team that was accidentally placed in the wrong conference tournament and then just play down to their competition. And it was really important for Western to be able to respond from those big comebacks. You know, Southern Miss was leading by, it was two two or three possessions in like at the very end. And what was able for Western for them to be able to come back, it wasn't Alexis Govan sometimes. Chastity Gooch struggled, but it was Tasia Brown that yep. I thought really stepped up. And she was a freshman, and she would come in and hit the shot that ended the run. It would be the shot that 
what, that would force Southern Miss to take a timeout or Old Dominion to take a timeout, and then Western would get some momentum back. And Josh, you did a great feature on it on ExtraPoint.com about it, and it was just she made she really stepped up and was one of the players that Western needed in a tournament run like this. Yeah, it, you're going to look at at 20 points a game from Alexis Govan. You're going to look at the girl that. Rick Cantu just talked about Chastity Gooch. It's it's obvious what that side is looking at in this Chastity Gooch, which if you let Alexis Govain up under the radar, but that's not the point. You look at those two girls. <laughs> not yet, at least. Not yet, at least. You look at those two girls, and that's just like, here's WKU. I mean, the, the two of the best scorers in Conference USA. But Taser Brown and Bria Gaines, and I, I had a similar feeling with Bria Gaines in that Southern Miss game because she came in and they went on an 11-0 run, and she came in and they went on a 4-0 run. We sat next to Chad Bishop on press row for the weekend, and we saw Robert Sampson, the basketball SID for the Lady Toppers, hand Chad Bishop of now BKO a voting sheet for all the tournament team. And you jokingly said, hey, Robert, where's my uh, sheet or whatever? And he, he kind of laughed it off and go, yep, putting Bria Gaines down. He said, that's why you're not voting. And she turned out to be really <laughs> valuable, especially no, yeah, in that championship and She was game. one of the girls, the first... She, she she went came in and they went on an 11-0 run. She came in the second time and they went on a 4-0 run. Her plus minus on the court was like plus 12 when everyone else was under 10. Can she was dropped a plus minus. Weirdly, on the show. I'll drop so not many hockey. plus minus stats. Hockey. What's the difference? You, what is your plus minus in, ho- minus in hockey like it's, point one? No, it's it's the same thing. It's just more calculatable. That's not a word, but I'm going with it because of the lack of of goals scored. That's not the point. Bria Gaines. <laughs> Was very valuable in the minutes, depending whatever your addition subtraction score says, Fletcher. She was very valuable, and and Coach Hurd said that afterwards. It has to be those girls. If we're gonna if we're transitioning to you know what they need to do, it has to be girls like Bria Gaines and Tasia Brown because when you have the the link that Texas does. They're going to be able to stop either Chastity Gooch or Alexis Govan. Or if you're at a school the size of Texas and the the Yukons and the Tennessees of the of the women's college basketball world, their entire team is filled with Chastity Gooches and Alexis Govans. And it's, I wouldn't it's, say that. I mean, Chastity Gooch and Alexis Govan are really good players. They they're probably like the second best player on on a Texas. They're probably the third or fourth best player on, on UConn. a Yukon, but they're still really. You don't have four of them. You have them up. You just said the starting lineup of UConn would include four Chastity Gooches. You, said you just four, said you said Chastity Gooches and Alexis Govan. That would be eight players. Okay, one of one of the two would be composed of the entire starting lineup at least of any one high level of women's college basketball. F- fact or fiction? Just continue. <sighs> I've lost my train of thought now. <laughs> the point being, the Lady Toppers need production from elsewhere, from the Bria Gaines, from the uh, from the Browns, even from Ivy Brown, who didn't, who played a lot of good basketball down the backstretch, but didn't really play uh, much of a tournament because of uh, Gaines stepping up. But it, it can't just be all Gooch and Govan like we're accustomed to seeing in Sun Belt play, like we're accustomed to seeing in Conference USA play. Interesting fact time here on Red Zone. Michael Jones scored God, zero points like a buzzer. in the final wow, game wow, interesting against fact Southern time. Miss. But she had, what, nine assists and nine one assists, turnover? And she is, ha, has to continue that production. You know, you see zero points and you think, wow, is she not playing well? But, you know, a nine-to-one turnover ratio is pretty outstanding. And it, it's funny to to talk about how similar the Southern Miss and Old Dominion games were, but it's also funny to talk about how different they were because in, in oh. one game, in, in the Old Dominion game, you got production from everyone. You got Kendall Noble, who was on the verge of a quadruple double or something. That's just an like average that. game for her, really. Yes, exactly. I, it, if there was another player outside of Anthony Davis that I've seen in college basketball and thought they could get a quadruple double with blocks, rebounds, assi- or steals and points, it's Kendall Noble. And it's, I, I don't know if defense is key in on her next year, but if they don't, she's getting a quadruple double. Mark it down. So, so anyway, the old Dominion game, you have you have someone who's just doing everything in, in Kendall Noble. You got Chastity Gooch and Alexis Govan scoring double figures, so everyone's kind of helping out. And then in the Southern Miss game, while it, w- it wasn't the case, it just seemed like any time something good happened for WKU's way when it was close, it was Alexis Govan. And so twenty-seven th- of thirty-five between Govan and Gooch in the first half. Yep, twenty-seven of thirty-five red zone. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it, it really was, and I think part of that has to do with it was a lower scoring game a little bit. Southern Miss a better defensive team. But you also had four points from Bria Gaines. And Kendall mm-hmm. Noble was a little bit rough. Uh, she she didn't have the game she wanted to, but she did have a bucket late that was really yeah, big. When, when Govan missed that three-point shot, she was able to get that rebound and put it home two of her six points. Right. And to quote Jimmy Strasburg on today's Sports Minute, <laughs> I see that. What were you doing? So Kendall Noble was really important. She had 20 points, I believe, against Baylor last year. 
she's she's that third option really she's better than a third option for most teams but she's the third option here on WKU yep. and so if Texas keys in on Gooch or Texas keys in on Govan I think the most important position becomes Kendall Noble and the second po- most important position becomes a combination of Ileana Johnson and Micah Jones well, because if those does, two where girls does, where does Brown fit in there huh where does, where does Brown, Taja Brown fit yeah. in there she's off the bench like I'm talking about these these starting, starting okay these starting, starting lineup. lineup gotcha if you key in on those players then the combination of Micah Jones and Ileana Johnson has a chance with a junior and a senior to frustrate that freshman inexperienced point guard from Texas. Well, we've seen that a little bit in the conference tournament, and Alexis Govan's able to come in and she has an energy spark, it seems like. She, you know, she's screaming at the players. She wants it so bad. You know, I would have felt really bad for her if, if Western didn't win this conference tournament just because how much energy she was showing. But at times, her and Gooch can fade away, and that's when these teams – in this conference tournament that we just watched, we were able to go on these runs that we're able to come out when Western goes up 24-2. to So somebody has to step up, and whether you're, your instance of Kendall, Kendall Noble, she usually gets it done on the defensive end. Offensively, she'll score around 10 or 12 points, but she's not the spark, really. A spark is going to have to come from, at least in my opinion, I think Ivy Brown. I think she comes in, she's going to hit a three here or there. She's going to be like a, a Tim Henderson for a Louisville team that comes in and hits a few corner threes. She's going to make a difference. If she does what Tim Miss Henderson Kentucky does, basketball. if she does what Tim Henderson did for Louisville, then she better, you know, I heard when, when he did that, he's like, Tim Henderson better buy a used car dealership in Louisville and never work again. Because everyone <laughs> would go to Tim Henderson used cars. He could just always have, like, deals with the number three in it. <laughs> so if Ivy Brown hits, if he she has that performance, then used car dealership in Bowling Green deals with the number three. Well, and, it, go ahead, Billy. They, they're going to be corralled. Chastity Gooch is not going to score 30 points in the game versus Texas. You know, and Alexis Govan is going to get hers, and, you know, they're both going to have – I'm sure decent games because they lead this team, but there's going to have to be an extra factor for Western to win this game. They come in as the 12 seed for a reason. Texas is the better team mm. right off the bat, and mm. so they have to be able to come back and or not come back. I'm not going to argue that Texas is a, a worse team, but they WK shouldn't be. A no, I, Just no. Yeah, that's, I completely agree. That's what I'm saying, but it's still the matchup that they got. They still got a better matchup than they would have gotten if they would have gotten a nine or a ten seed. So something has to happen. They get a better. I think they get a better two matchups between the first and second round, but they don't get a better initial matchup. I mean, you'd rather play a seven seed than a five seed in the NCAA tournament. They might have an easier road to the Sweet 16 overall, but this is a tough Texas team. I don't think they got a better matchup than if they got a nine or an eight seed. And I think Rick hit it out of the part when he said you could throw the seeds away because I I certainly thought WKU would be at, at worst a 10 seed, and somehow they slipped into that 12 seed margin there. It'll be interesting to see because last year against Baylor, Baylor had two... Of, of the best scores in, in, in the nation. It just the best scores in the they country. They were very good at scoring the Combined basketball. for 63 points in one game. And WKU is a good defensive team, but they let two players combine for 61 points. They can't do that against Texas. They have to play great team defense. Offensively, I think you've got enough players in Govan. They, didn't, they weren't shut down against a better team last year. Even without Alexis Govan, they had yep. three players score 18 or more. Like They're, they're going to score. This is an offensive team. If they play team defense and rebound, if they rebound, if they rebound, if they rebound. That's a good point because Texas comes in ranked 12th in the nation in rebounding. And they if led, they rebound, they led b- the Big 12 play in in, in defensive rebounds, I'm, I'm assuming. Guys, you don't need to my point. They, they allowed, if they rebound. We'll say rebound again. Rebound. Finish your point. Re- uh, that, that's that's got to be the biggest key to the game for me. Because Wait, in, in, every, in every game in the conference tournament – WKU gave up more than 15 offensive rebounds. Yeah, that's not good. That's 15 extra shots. It doesn't matter if you hold a team to 44% to get 15 extra shots. You look at the box score and you're like, okay, well, WKU held them to this, and they had this many steals and this many turnovers, and what the? Oh, 23 offensive rebounds. And against a team that's got three players in their starting lineup that are as tall or taller than WKU's entire starting five, that's rebounding, man. It's It's got – if they can control the glass – they can win this game. If they don't, that'll be hard, even if they can hit threes. Yeah, they're going to have to control really the pain. They don't have to win the rebounding battle, but it has to be a lot better than it has been. You're absolutely right. And Chastity Gooch has to make a presence known. She, uh, She's a, little, a, scrap, a scrappy player inside. She's going to have to make a huge presence. So we'll come back here in a second on WKU Red Zone Radio. When we return, we'll discuss who's had the best opening three years of a head coaching career here on the Hill. Michelle Clark Hurd's making a strong case for it, but... Our boy Fletch Topper has has got a lot of different records. Holla. A lot of different stats coming in on that. So stay tuned. 
Join the debate if you want on Twitter, at WKU Red Zone. Send us in who's had the best head coaching year in their first three seasons on the Hill, and we'll read them if there's anything good on air. You listen to the Red Zone on Revolution 91.7. Remember when your neighbor found us naked in the car And the time some outdoor action got us kicked out of the park Getting frisky in the dark, I gave your eye a poke I think the dog is also in the bed Do I smell smoke, you and me? We never, ever, ever give up You didn't give up on sex Don't give up on birth control either There are more methods than you think Visit Bedsider.org to compare all the choices Brought to you by Bedsider and the Ad Council Bedsider.org Who might you save? Your mother, your father, your husband, uncle, aunt, son. Learn fast. F-A-S-T. The sudden signs of a stroke. F. Face drooping. A. Arm weakness. S. Speech difficulty. T. Time to call 911. You could save. Your friend, teacher, boss. So learn F-A-S-T. Then pass it on. Because you never know who might save you. Your wife, your colleague. Spot a stroke fast. Visit strokeassociation.org. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association and the Ad Council. Talking all things Tapper Sports, you're listening to Red Zone on Revolution 91.7. Coming into the back half of the Red Zone with Money Talks, and unfortunately so does Fletcher Keel here on Red Zone Radio. Hey, man, you don't get uh, you don't get bit best tist of the week for nothing. Please be careful how you say that so you don't slip up on radio. Josh Allen here with Billy Rutledge and Fletcher Keel. We've got 15 more minutes here in the red zone. We've talked, and Fletcher, down, Fletcher, Fletcher. <laughs> dropped his trophy. We started off by talking men's basketball and, and the finality of their season in the last 30 minutes and in the last 45, talking Lady Topper Hoops and it's well-deserved, fellows, after a record-setting season in the Conference USA. 30 yep. wins for the first time ever for a ever. Conference USA ever. women's ever. team. Five ever. And it also it was, it was a, lot, a culmination of a lot of things in that game. And one of them was Michelle Clark Hurd's 100th win as a coach of as WKU. A head coach. Well, as no. a, as a, excuse me, as, as a, a head, as coach, a head overall. coach overall. 76 as a coach at WKU. 76 wins in three years. So... 22 wins a year. That's okay. That's solid. That's okay coming in when the team was 9 and 21. Excuse me, tw- like 27 wins a year. I'm, my math was terrible on that. It, exactly. Come in at 9 and 21. Michelle Clark heard her first three seasons on the Hill have been impeccable. Just just sit in this, fellas. 40 of the last 45 times that Michelle Clark heard has led a team onto the floor, they have won. 40 of 45. That's okay. And that includes losses to we're looking uh, at two like Baylor in last year's tournament. Uh, the number one team in the nation and uh, at the time unbeaten Mississippi State this past year. The Louisville game was kind of a fluke. Uh, Lady Toppers just didn't get going. It Louisville's a two back. seed, so well early, so in, early in the season. Three of the last five, three of the last five losses have been against teams that are top three seeds in the tournament right now. So one of those teams they got revenge on on Saturday by winning a conference tournament against them. So you know, but forty of the last forty-five times. That's consistent. It, this 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 career for Michelle Clark Hurd, I don't know if you can get off to a better start after coming in replacing Mary Taylor Cowes at nine and twenty one. It begs it begs the question. She has a regular season conference tournament and two Sun Belt Conference Championships. One conference or one Sun Belt Championship, one Conference USA Championship. Gosh, just the whole the whole did they change conferences? But I've I've heard something so, about w- that. Two conference championships, one in Sun Belt, one in the Conference USA, there and a go. tournament championship in Conference USA as well. Is this the best three seasons to start off a WKU coaching career that we've seen in recent memory? It's very close, and and it's funny to think when you say recent memory and how good she actually is, but right on the men's side, Ray Harper has done an excellent job as well. And you say all the stats from Michelle Clark heard. He, Harper just got his third straight 20-win season. We talked about earlier in the show something that John Oldham, E.A. Diddle both didn't do. He led them to two conference championships and two NCAA tournament appearances in his time. Not the same Maybe not right up there with Michelle Clark Hurd, but at the same time, it's almost the same the basketball a- programs have right. come up. It's almost the same accomplishments, except for the fact that Clark Hurd's winning percentage is much better. Well, that's now, just it's yeah. a little bit different. But it's yeah, no, no, it's totally men's and I, women's. I understand that that they, I don't, I mean the women's the women's competition in this conference is pretty good with MTSU, Southern Miss, Louisiana it was pretty Tech. good in the Sun Belt as well with UALR. As well. Right, I, I don't think we can argue. I think you can argue maybe the circumstance was different with Ray Harper with what he dealt with injury wise. You know, he 
Lady Toppers lost Alexis Govan last year, but they never lost a point guard. And that's really important in, in the college game. It seemed like three years in a row, WKU lost a point guard up to this season, and you see what happens when Ray Harper had a, a healthy one. But that winning percentage from Michelle Clark heard. My goodness. Let's let's run down through some numbers here with you. I don't like numbers. Random stats. I have, I have four random. four other coaches, and I went through and, and counted up there. I didn't actually count. I just took it from the stat guide. Thanks, WKU Sports. Their first three or records after their first three years. We'll start with Ray Harper. 20 wins in each of the last three years. 20 and 16, 20 and 12, 20 and 12, 16 and 40. Not bad. Only, what, 17 wins less than Michelle Clark heard in her first three years here? That's like a and whole now, season. Yeah, and now <laughs> I'm, it's funny you say that because that's not including the half season that he took over when T.J. Price's and George Fant's freshman year. So these right. are the first three full seasons that ended in Birmingham this past season. Which Todd Stewart said was the best coaching job he's ever seen. He went 11-8, and eight, went to the NCAA tournament, won their first game. Sure did. By lost, the way. lost to the National Champs Kentucky. Continue. Anyways, did you guys see – the, the <laughs> you mentioned that one game they won against Mississippi L.A. State when they had that – Historic comeback. Did you see Ole Miss game last night? It's and the power of Bjork. Did you see Ross Bjork's tweet? No. Yes. Ross Bjork said that he he told he always tells Andy Kennedy that story, Andy Kennedy being the coach of Ole Miss. He always tells Andy Kennedy about that story, about that comeback against Mississippi Valley State, and he said Coach Kennedy hated it until they came back from double digits last night to beat BYU. And the ir- irony in all of this is the Hilltoppers beat Ole Miss in, uh, or what is it, Gro- o- Old Grove, the Grove? Where, did they, where does Ole Miss play? I have no idea. Where's Ole Miss campus? It was about like it, right the, now. it was like 16 <laughs> points, wasn't it? Western da- came back down in Mississippi. Yeah, it was something ridiculous at halftime. 15, 16 they, points. They just had a had a monster second half. We are way off topic. So Ray Harper, 16, 40 in his first three years. Michelle Clark heard 77 and 24 or 76 and 24 in her first three years. Willie Taggart, uh, obviously a much smaller sample sample size, went two and ten. Did he not have 20 win seasons? He he <laughs> did not. He did have 20 overall losses though, 16 and 20 with that two and ten record, and then back to back seven and five years took the tops to the uh, Little Caesars Pizza Bowl back in 2012. Uh, Matt Myers. 25 and 33. Well, technically, Lance Guidry took him to the Little Caesars Pizza Bowl. He took him. Lance Guidry <laughs> coached him. Well, perspective, they were also going to, you know, FBS for the first time. And well, the level been, of competition was they had been in the FCS, so much F- greater. They had been in the FBS for a couple years before well, Taggart took over. But the thing about this is is a lot of what Taggart brought with him is still on the field playing. And Brandon Dowdy and, and a lot of uh, any – it's a safe bet anytime you see someone is from Florida – that it's because Willie Taggart brought him here. Uh, Matt Myers, the baseball coach, a bit of a, a difference here. He has a better, he has more wins, but also more losses than uh, Clark Hurd does. Twenty-five and thirty-three his first year. Twenty-nine and tw- or twenty-eight and twenty-nine two years ago, and then twenty-nine and twenty-eight last year. Eighty-two wins, ninety losses, and then Travis Hudson, one of the, if not the most successful coach on the hill right now, started with two single win seasons. His first season went seven and twenty-six. His third season went nine and twenty-two. And now he's having single. 18, loss seasons. With an 18 and 17 record in there, and now he's having exactly single loss seasons, and and is making the tournament NCAA tournament year in and year out. So it looks like you you we can, and this is the only time we'll ever take you out, Coach. But we'll take Travis Hutchinson out of that conversation because his first three years record wise, it didn't start off as hot as these other three. Now, that will also, anyone else ever catch his next ten? I don't know. That also, and it was in like '95. So this is not recent memory by no, any chance, but someone's still here. It's someone's at WKU. memory. Yeah, but. So Barely. if you're looking at Myers, he's had some disappointing starts to seasons and really been marred by inconsistency. There's mm-hmm. been a couple times where you look at a guy like Tanner Perkins, where his, you know, you, if your ace has Tommy John, it's hard to fault some weekend losses. I'm a Braves fan. Don't talk to me about Tommy and John. Some, and Tommy tough John. competition for right. baseball. It's a little bit. I would even think a little bit higher than the basketball teams have faced because in the Sun Belt you have great competition, and now in Conference USA, Rice is you know one of the top programs. And it's right. like baseball. He's had some tough teams to play against as well. So it's really it really is difficult to compare these, but we're not going to cop out that way. No, we are going to try our hardest. I'm I'm going with MCH, and maybe part of it is recency. Maybe because when we look at things like who's the greatest of all time or who's this, it's almost always it, it's almost always a guy right now or a guy twenty years ago. It's not like the guy it's, five years ago. It's the LeBron. It's the LeBron M- or LeBron Michael Jordan. James. The LeBron James Michael Jordan scenario. If you ask someone in seventh grade right now who's better, he'll probably say LeBron James. But if you ask someone who graduated two years ago, he'll probably say Michael Jordan. So if we ask someone in seventh grade who's better, Ray Harper, or Michelle Clark. <laughs> Who? I would just, I would just, my heart would smile if a seventh grader here knew who both of those were. I just the the way that, you know, Harper took a team that was floundering, 
and got them in a tournament mentality. That, but it just, but here, here's the difference for me between Harper and Coach Hurd. Harper got a team that was floundering and took them to tournament mentality. Then the next season, they floundered again, then tournament mentality. Then the next season, tournament they, mentality floundered in the conference. Yeah, tournament. and then the next season, really good, you know, pretty good, you know, regular season, and then. Well, it's not even but that. But for Clark Hurd, she continues to raise a level play every season. Well, it's not even that. Is Ray Harper was here to bring guys to WKU because he was an assistant coach under Ken McDonald for, for a while. And Michelle Clark Hurd came over from a, a completely different program. So she herself has built the foundation and continues to raise the building higher and higher and higher going along with my uh, – my architecture joke there, not really joke, metaphor comparison. Anyways, so so Ray Harper knew the pieces he had, and and Clark Hurd necessarily <laughs> didn't because she didn't have a hand in bringing him there. Uh, interesting note between the two coaches that currently coach here is in their first year they got two recruits that you know they didn't recruit. I know you said Ray Harper was the assistant coach, but it, he wasn't the coach that actually brought him in. Yeah, it, you know, so to say, Michelle Clark Hurd starts with Chastity Gooch and Alexis Scovan. She builds them up into two of the best women's players of all time for Western. Harper starts with Price and Fant. He does the same thing. So an interesting uh, similarity between these two is they've been able to bring their own mindset and culture and their own players, but they've also been able to coach players that they didn't bring in themselves personally to high states. And that's why you, Josh talked about earlier in the show where you're not going to see the face of a franchise from well, all four years, start freshman in a while now, but they were able to do that. So it just shows their so coaching WKU ability. fans, if, if they have any inkling of how – you know, how how good this women basketball team could be for a very long time? They should probably show up because if WKU fans don't show up and someone higher call, is calling for Michelle Clark Hurd, she ought to take that job, even yes. though it's an alma mater. So, and and one more thing to uh, to bounce off of Billy's point bounce is off, to to bounce off. I I think I will if I can remember it. My mind's actually drawing a blank. <laughs> to so build go, off go Billy's on. foundation. Yeah, th- very good, Josh. I'm, that was a better, art, of you. That was a better oh, no. architecture joke I, than yours. It, it, Josh always has better jokes than I. Now, I was, remember Not what I was going to say now. Oh, the, that's a good arc of events. I had a point. I forgot it. Now I got it. Now I got it now. <laughs> It's like the Gateway Arch in St. Louis. Trying to get you to forget it again. No, I I, I remember it. Uh, after after the Lady Toppers won the tournament, they they still held a press conference, which I was actually a little surprised of, with the five media members still there. But one of the things that I loved that Alexis Govan said was when talking about Coach Hurd and saying that she believed in her and Chastity Gooch and, and the rest of the team that was there, even though that they weren't necessarily recruited to play at WKU, they just kind of came along to the program because it was available to them. And just to see what Coach Hurd has done with that. And, and the bond that the Lady Tops, uh, in terms of the players, have with Coach Hurd is something that is is very rare, I think, even for for this le- this level, not professional or, or whatever, but it, it's a, it's almost like a high school bond or a, a, a church league bond where they really buy into anything and everything that Coach Hurd says. Well, they'll need to buy in. Uh, big game on Friday, just about 48 hours away between WKU and Texas. And guys, before we wrap up here, gut feelings over what happens on Friday. Uh, gut feeling is I think Western takes a lead in this game. I think that Western does what they did in the conference tournament and they blow that lead. And then the final minutes are decided inside the paint. And I think that Texas has a little bit more size and that rebounding thing is going to kill them. So I, uh, on the Western Kentucky radio show, I'm going to take Texas. I, I don't see one team jumping out of the gate over the other. I think it'll be a close game, and I think it will truly be people will see the score and see how close it is and be like, that's a 5-12 game. And, again, going back to what Rick said, 5-12, it could be whatever. These, te- these two teams are, are pretty going to be pretty evenly matched. The the one thing I'm wondering about is how big of a difference will last year's game against Baylor without Alexis Govan be and this year's game against Texas be with Alexis Govan. So I'm trying to figure out how big of a difference she'll be, um, and I see the Lady Toppers losing by less than 10. It'll be like a, a seven, eight, nine point win for Texas, I think. I think for the first time in quite some time, I guess since L- Louisville, WKU plays the majority of the game from not leading. Even even these these close games where the Lady Toppers found a way to emerge victorious, they were leading and then it was tied or the lead was taken. I mean, Southern Miss did have a lead under two minutes. Yep. But Southern Miss wasn't leading for the first four, like the first thirty. Yep. So. I think for the first time, this team has to battle back from maybe a double-digit lead from behind. I just don't know if they get quite back to, to taking that advantage. And so I, I see something along the lines of a 10-point, 12-point halftime deficit where WK is not really firing all cylinders, struggling inside, and then that, that spark from Govan that we talk about or that 
that defensive spark from Kendall Noble shows up and they get it within five. I think it's I think it's a two possession ball game, and I think Texas is is a is a pretty darn good team that, as Rick Cantu said, found their way without their their leading scorer in the season and. It's going to be a good one, though. I think people that watch this game from either side or an unbiased side are going to see a good basketball game. Yeah, absolutely. And I was thinking about it today and just how unlucky WKU is for one of the the great – we even heard Rick say one of the the better women's basketball fan bases. A, a majority of them probably won't be able to get to see this game live and go out to support him with Berkeley being you know 2,500 miles away. Unfortunate. But yep. you can see it live on ESPN2 tomorrow at 4 p.m. That's all we got here tonight from the Red Zone. We talked a little bit of men's hopes and a lot of Lady Topper hoops because they deserve it. First season ever in Conference USA Women's History with 30 wins. Michelle Clark Hurd's 100th win. Alexis Govain winning most outstanding player of the Conference USA tournament. That bought them one more game, and they will have to buy in once again to Coach Hurd's philosophy because that trio of Govan, Gooch, and Hurd will be necessary. Today, the trio of Holland. Rutledge and Keel was necessary here on Red Zone Radio on Revolution 91.7.